Right, uh, welcome back for the uh, second afternoon uh, panel of this uh, symposium. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce my uh, dear colleague, uh, Daniel Sarada, uh, to you, most of you will know him. Uh, and he, in a way, also is a um, successor of Peter Kyle on uh, that chair, because when the, when the chair was split and party took over the um, literature side of the uh, Dutch Studies uh, uh, chair, uh, in, a, in a way, in here it is, in, the, in a long line of successes, he was the last incumbent of the institutionalized chair right. before he left uh, to take over the directorship of the Fiske Academy in Leobarden and retired a couple of years ago, yeah. but is still like uh, an honorary member of the department, Dutch department here at UCL and he's going to present uh, to us uh, on the 18th century. Yeah. Uh, so I belong to the, the, the other half, the twin chair, so to speak. Uh, so my predecessor was Ren Meijer, uh, a writer of literature of the Low Countries, and before him we had half a century of, uh, what's his name again, I guess, but he did very uh, interesting uh, books and he succeeded to Harting. So there's just three steps between me and uh, Gael. And Harting actually benefited after the Second World War because the department and English studies in the Netherlands by setting up the Harting uh, Scholar Exchange that benefited many uh, students of English in the, in the Low Countries and many Dutch departments in this uh, country. Um, and we're all back now at, uh, at UCL. But that's for uh, another time. I'd like to begin my presentation with a tribute to Peter Gehl by Alice Carter in her monograph The Dutch Republic in Europe in the Seven Years War of 1971. She says there in the preface, I was one of the many English students Professor Gehl taught to love his mother country and to want to learn about relations between the Netherlands and England, which Gehl had come to regard as his second fatherland. Professor Bogman, also a student of Chaos, has written recently of the freedom with which we were allowed to choose our own area of research and make our own discoveries therein, in our own way and at our own time. We could draw our own conclusions to which Chaos would listen cautiously before kindly revealing to us the fallacies apt to beset the young student who starts working on his own. We were not submitted to unsought direction, though it was always to be had upon request. Nor were we intimidated by obita dicta, though we would not, I think, have been permitted to harbor doubts about the greater Netherlands theory. With that one exception, his seminars were meetings of free minds. And I think that is a very characteristic uh, assessment and tribute. Uh, from her. In 1968, as, um, uh, another such tribute uh, prefaces the volume on Britain and the Netherlands in Europe and Asia, edited by Bromley and Cosman, the papers of the Third Anglo Dutch Historical Conference. Uh, even in Latin, it's a dedication in Latin, which I'll spare you, but it says, dedicated with a grateful heart to the re revered memory of Peter Gehl, prudent teacher, excellent writer extraordinary friend. So great tributes from Dutch and British uh, historians, um, which uh, in a, a few years after is followed by the canonization in the obituary by Fumal Dunk of 1972, who finally comes to a decision on Gael's significance as a historian, mentioning on the one hand the important stimuli to innovation emanating from his work, but at the same time also notes that today his work belonged to a completed period in historiography. This is 1972. Fast forward to 1995 and we see in uh, Jonathan Israel's The Dutch Republic, Gael is mentioned, but not very much. There's only very few references and of course uh, the subject has moved on and the names and uh, works of historians of the next generation dominates the narrative. But in the same year, 1995, Kosman also explicitly came to the conclusion the work of Gael 
no longer excites us, it no longer challenges us, but it does strike us by its force, liveliness and spontaneity. It goes without saying that he will continue to be valued as a great historian, as he wanted and expected. It's quite remarkable because in a sense, um, Cosman, Mayer, Israel, uh, Theo Hermans too, can be seen as intellectual hairs in their focus on low countries in the titles of their works, in the literature of the low countries, um, uh, low countries history, the low countries history seminar, um, and Cosman's book that was mentioned uh, this morning. Quite remarkable, they are his intellectual hairs, um, but they uh, came to the same sort of distancing, I think, in their uh, revaluation and, and retrospect. And Cosman went a bit further even by saying, look, Gell was not a theoretician. And actual innovation in historiography came after him and was thanks due in large part to the intellectual input and stimulus from outside, from other disciplines and from uh, of roles. Uh, and you can think of uh, many other British historians that play a role there. So, um, these different uh, assessments from different scholars in different times, they raise the question why Gael, who reads him still, who rereads him still, uh, who needs him, uh, who needs his work, why or why not? Um, or is he perhaps dated, passé, as he had his time, uh, and can he be seen as a distinguished ghost uh, from the past? Or the other way, uh, the way I want to look at it here, um, what about his work and what about its lasting value? And specifically then, here today about the 18th century. Was the 18th century uh, a late hobby, perhaps, uh, of his, like for Marx, who in his old age preferred to be Diderot and his friends, uh, to relax his mind. So uh, a hobby uh, for old men before they forget. Or did it perhaps uh, come to the point, especially through the Second World War, uh, we must think, for example, of uh, the communist writer Turin de Vries, who also found occasion in the Second World War to produce a biography of Schimmelpenning, uh, also an earlier dictator like the Napoleon of the Napoleon book. So similar circumstances, similar outputs. So the question then is, we look at his 18th century work and um, what, what has this produced, what value has this? Um, so what I will not do here is to uh, discuss other subjects that come up in uh, the other lectures on the program, uh, his sources at, uh, uh, at the Institute here in the library, uh, his politics, uh, his person, his vanity, uh, his greater Netherlands ideas. Um, I mean, I've been for 25 years on the board of editors of the Dutch Flemish journal Ons Erfdale and the English language yearbook The Low Country. So, yes, in a sense, I'm a double inheritor of Geel, not just because of the chair here, but also uh, because of my membership of the editorial board of those two publications. Um, but of course, even in this wonderful program today, which is really a, a smorgasbord of uh, aspects of uh, Geel, uh, there are things that, uh, other things that, that, that could be added. Uh, think about the colonial past, it came up uh, in, in one of the things, but it was for me uh, an important uh, getting to know moment uh, in relation to Geel. Um, in um, 2007, I was reading the journal uh, by Montagu, famous 17th century text, Skipper, um, and I read it in uh, the English uh, translation and edition produced by Geel, 
And in it, we read that Bon Tuku, on his journal home from Java to the Netherlands, um, pauses in an Irish harbor, and Gael adds a note that there was an English warship, and Bon Tuku was pretty apprehensive seeing that the relations between Holland and England at the time were not very friendly. Um, and Bon Tuku himself doesn't tell us this. It's, it's in the annotations, it's not in the text. So that puts me uh, on the course of thinking what other things might there be that Bontecu doesn't tell us. And when you start looking, of course, you find things. And in the letters by Don Peterson, whom you find the key, Bontecu is there mentioned as member of the War Council um, in Jakarta, in Batavia at the time, where they have to fight the British fleet. And Bontecu, when you look closer, was in charge of a warship. That's also not in the book, where he is presented as a peaceful, um, God-fearing Dutch skipper next to God, going out for trade and coming back with honest uh, rewards. But that is uh, not the case, uh, let me say. So. Uh, what I learned from this, and what Gael stimulates you into doing, is to engage in the philological, historical, and detective work on the basis of sources, uh, uh, and then uh, see what you find. Now, um, another aspect there is that uh, Gael, um, I mean, Van Huysenga, you can say he is his style is dated by the 80s movement in the 1880s in Dutch literature. It's very embellished, it's, it, has, uh, it engages with mythical and uh, uh, symbolic uh, aspects of history. Um, Gerl, on the other hand, is more an inheritor of the style of uh, Multituli. He is as combative as that famous author uh, who is at the top of the Dutch uh, canon, and he engages in uh, polemics throughout his career. There is his well-known, long-standing uh, polemic against uh, his colonial predecessor in Leiden, Kohlebrander, um, and there are articles by him, like the Statis van de Taikritiek um, on Kohlebrander, where uh, we see Gael very seriously pursuing the matters of interpretation of historical documents, just as in the previous one. So to me, as a linguist who also does history, that is a very interesting bridging prospect, stimulated by Gael's activity as a critical historian. And of course, there is his famous um, debates in the letters he exchanged with his colleague uh, Gerritsson, uh, absolutely top quality polemic, also about the 18th century, um, where we see that on um, both at the top of their abilities as historians, engaging in very sharp and uh, serious uh, discussion. That is the craft of the historian as they seem to have perceived it. And as Tollebeek also has made clear, it is his, his, uh, history writing on the principle of uh, criticism and the critical philosophy of history that uh, belongs to it, uh, which may not be so much of a philosophy as more as a sort of, well, a discussion without end, which is perhaps the Dutch uh, or English variety of what the French call you shot des opinions, j'ai la vérité. It's uh, you, you have to realize that there are different views and only by accepting that you may hope to find um, the, the truth in the matter. That is what has inspired me in my studies of Dutch colonial past in 2004 when I discussed the various images and counter images of the colonial past in the East Indies and again in 2009 in Dutch Crossing when I wrote an article about doing justice in a plural society, precisely the problem of what law, what laws, what rights should apply in the, uh, uh, 
in, in the colonial history out in the East Indies. Now, when we now look at Gerald's work in the 18th century, uh, the first thing that strikes you is the uh, very considerable output. Studies about oranges, um, studies about what's going on in the Republic, uh, studies about conflicts there, uh, editions of letters, um, studies about rebellions, um, culminating in studies about the Patriot Revolution that happened well before the French Revolution. Um, it's an astonishing uh, production. Um, uh, if, only, if you think only of the, the letters of Willem Bentwick, uh, edited uh, by him and, and Gerritsson, um, and so many other things you think, oh, uh, they must not have had too many students, they must not have had that many management meetings or that, many, that much uh, policy gatherings. Uh, they could concentrate on the sources and study them and produce books. The quantity is great. The, uh, uh, the fact is he covered all periods and all, uh, uh, all periods of Dutch history. The, Dutch, the 18th century production forms a major part. Um, his uh, many-sidedness well, comes to the fore in this whole conference, but from the appraisals it's clear that the quality is also uh, very high indeed. Um, for example, his book of 1924 on Stadthouder William IV and England uh, is praised uh, in the newspapers, uh, but also in the, uh, for example, in, in history, I quote, the, 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 the British journal History, um, it offers a narrative both vivid and sincere, and it is established on solid foundations. And the historische Zeitschrift in Germany uh, calls it eine sorgfältige, fein abgewogene Darstellung der niederländischen Landesgeschichte. So it's not just in uh, in the Netherlands that he was appreciated right from the start. This is his second major work. Um, and the same can be said of his uh, next great work in 1936, Revolutie uh, to Amsterdam, in 1748, Revolutionary Days in Amsterdam. When you read that book, hell is just on top of the action. You, you can almost follow it from hour to hour. It, it, it is a, a careful reconstruction with great respect and sensitivity also to the confusions of everyday history as it happens. It's based on numerous pamphlets, letters, eyewitness accounts, and everything done with the most thorough uh, account of uh, the, the sources and how they were uh, studied, and all to build up uh, an interpretation uh, of the situation in 1748, the middle of the 18th century, where, as he says, you can see the beginning of that revolution against the oranges in 1787. Um, so, uh, praise indeed for his scholarly work. But of course, criticism as well. Um, and I, I stay with the, the topic of uh, rebellion and sedition. Um, well, Gale died in 1966, and straight after, a, a, a decade later, there is Rudolf Decker with his two monographs on uh, rebellions in Holland uh, of 1979 and 1982. Uh, <clears throat> Decker had a far larger uh, database. He knew of many more rebellions in the 200 years of the 17th and 18th century. And moreover, he had the benefit of a very careful, considered uh, conceptual network, which enabled him to very precisely define what was a rebellion, what was sedition, what was a revolution, etc. Um, and from it, um, Decker uh, manages to demonstrate that uh, well, Holland wasn't 
the calm and quiet um, uh, backwater that it held to be. I mean, you may know Baudelaire, the invitation uh, au voyage, that's inspired by his idealized view of Holland. La toute n'est cordre et beauté, luxe calme et volupté. None of it. I mean, it is a story of continuous um, uh, uh, rebellion. But Decker says he thinks Geel shares with other Dutch historians this idea that it was calm and he had a, a blind spot for such a sedition. I, I disagree there, but okay, he makes the claim. And it is certainly true that after Geel there was more attention to this aspect. Um, and of course, um, Decker, as he should do, criticizes Geel where in the history of the uh, Dutch people, people um, Geel mentions uh, a smallish tax uh, rebellion in Amsterdam around about 1746 and Becker uh, demonstrates that this was actually the biggest Dutch tax revolt of uh, uh, the whole uh, 18th century. So there, okay, that is, um, and he argues that since Gell's, um, uh, since Gell died, there has been a very significant change in this uh, idea of the Dutch Republic in the 18th century. I would think that is precisely uh, where Gell himself couldn't have agreed more. That is what historians do. That is how, on the basis of better data and better insights, they improve our understanding of history. Now there is an aspect to Gael's work um, that has to do with the Second World War and that is his parti pris. He identified to some extent with his subject matter. He took sides. He s felt himself a patriot. He paid attention to the Dutch patriots uh, in order to establish a sort of democratic tradition uh, in Dutch history, just like Turbeck also uh, set out uh, to do. But um, even such a party plea for uh, Geel always had to come under the discipline of thorough investigation of the facts of arguments and discussion, pro and contra, uh, to find out uh, the truth about this emerging liberal democracy. So that's one way of looking at him. Yeah, he's criticized, he's superseded, he has his uh, quirks, he has his uh, taking sides, but he has the discipline uh, of his historian. Um, another way of ass assessing his quality is to think uh, of what came after him. Uh, and if you think of the huge flight that 18th century studies have taken in the Netherlands since the 1970s in cultural history, in uh, book history, in intellectual history, in political history, in uh, colonial history, um, in Dutch history as uh, done by uh, uh, foreign uh, historians, you could say, yes, that was all not there when he did his work. Um, but I, and so it's, in, as a historian, it's always dangerous to ask, well, uh, to think it happened after, so it must have something to do with what came before. But I think it is fair to say that, um, and I here I come back to the point made uh, uh, in the obituary that was mentioned uh, by uh, von der Dunk. Uh, there were uh, important innovations emanating for him, from him. He published in English, he engaged in public debate, he put sources always first, he um, said whatever you think, uh, your party plea, your myth, your preconceived ideas, they must be confirmed or disconfirmed by empirical research on the basis of sources. But throughout, 
in fact, that he engaged so seriously in 18th century history, which at the time was certainly not uh, high ranking in uh, Dutch historians' interests, has certainly been an important factor in generating all this new uh, research uh, in so many fields to do with the 18th century. As a result of that, today in 2016, we know much more in many fields, much more than Kael did. There has been a sea change in our knowledge and understanding of the 18th century, and that's not just because uh, there are better answers to the same old questions, but also totally new questions and different approaches. Uh, and there, I think, I will finish. Um, that has to do with uh, Decker again. Look at that book by Decker about rebellions. It's very interesting to see that Decker um, still concludes that, as he says in Dutch, elf land is an eigen patroon van sociale onrusting. Every country has its own characteristic pattern of social unrest. And that's a conclusion I would think that Geel could share without any difficulty. Then Decker goes on to identify the pattern of Dutch social unrest. There's the beginning in 1670 with a religious uh, almost uh, civil war. It ends in 1787 with a political almost civil war. And in between there is a plurality of rebellions. In the 17th century, uh, a lot of re religious uh, ones. In the second half of the 17th century, no longer. The whole of the 17th century, many tax revolts, but not in the 18th century. There are fierce revolts in years of crisis when uh, the uh, rebellions are especially orangist in 1672 and 1747 especially and there have been um, rebellions about the food supply but really actually only in the first half of the 18th century it's very interesting to look at how uh, Decker on the basis of his data identifies such a pattern and there again I would say Gell, if he had those data he would have done exactly the same uh, that makes him interesting uh, to me. So, yes, with his limitation, uh, Geil, I, I feel, has stimulated a lot of subsequent research into the dynamics of that 18th, 18th century uh, society in the Dutch Republic. He has uh, triggered uh, the major uh, interest. He has put it on the agenda national and internationally, and the fruits can be seen from the next generation that has done all this imaginative uh, research due to his important, innovative impulses. Thank you.